commencement address today will be given by Mr. Edward R. Murrow, director of the United States Information Agency and world-renowned for his career in radio and television. Mr. Murrow is a 1930 graduate of Washington State University. He received an LLD from his alma mater in 1946, and later this afternoon will receive the Regents Distinguished Alumnus Award. A personal pleasure to me to present to you Mr. Murrow. Mr. President, friends, sons, daughters, and supporters of Washington State University, I am home, and I could wish for the eloquence of the ancients. But since I am without eloquence, I can at least promise you brevity. <laughs> for brevity is good both when we are and are not understood. If any of you in the far corners have difficulty hearing me, I pray you remain silent. <laughs> Lest you, Mr. President, be tempted to emulate the chairman of a meeting in England when the speaker had been droning on for some time to no apparent purpose, when a small man in the far corner of the room rose and said, Mr. Chairman, I cannot hear a single word the speaker is saying at which point the chairman rose, bowed graciously, and said, I shall be delighted to change places with you. <laughs> I shall hope this afternoon to be constantly conscious of the experience of the visiting bishop at Yale, who took for his text the four letters Y-A-L-E. And he held forth for 10 minutes on why for youth and impressed no one. But nothing daunted, he carried on for seven minutes and 10 seconds on A for ambition, at which time he had lost most of his audience. But being a determined bishop, he pressed on with four minutes and 10 seconds on L for loyalty, by which time he had lost most of his audience. But he carried on with four minutes on E for energy, at the end of his discourse, the choir filed down the center aisle and the bishop followed them. And there in the rearmost pew, he found a student still on bended knee. And he waited till the student looked up. And he said, young man, perhaps you would be good enough to tell me what it was I said that moved you so deeply that I find you still here on bended knee. And the student looked up and said, I was merely offering thanks that I go to Yale rather than to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. <laughs> you will, I am sure, understand if I read portions of this discourse, because having changed recently from the position of poacher to gamekeeper, <laughs> I have found it useful upon occasion uh, to have some record of what I attempted to say. <laughs> I am most grateful to you for welcoming me back to Washington State. Uh, those were happy years spent here. A man is the product of his education, his work, his travel, his reading, the sum total of his experience. But first among these mentioned, is, of course, education. It was here that I found the contagious spark that is curiosity, the ravenous excitement that devours ideas, the emanating wisdom that hopefully opens the pathway of logic, bypassing fancy and leading, we hope, to fact. I trust that as students, you have less levity of spirit than that woeful student who regarded as gospel the nostrum of knowledge from Butler. A hen is only an egg's way of making another egg. <laughs> Butler, I am told, 
was wont to finish off audiences that regarded his remarks with sober and serious mien, as you just did, with, with his parting sally, which was, how holy people look when they are seasick. I departed these portals some 32 years past. The world of my departure bears little resemblance to the world of my return. In the interim, the extremity of man's excesses have washed high on the sands of time. We are not, I think, handmaidens to but an incompetent providence. But it would take only the greatest act of faith to believe that what humans have done in these decades has all been done in the name of humankind. We live, commented William Dean Howells, but a world has passed away with the years that perished to make us men. We are engaged in a great confrontation with an implacable foe. It is both the refuge and the frustration of the academician to observe that the ultimate decision will be made upon the playing field of politics. Politics, of course, has often been called a game. But it was Bertrand de Juvenal who pointed out the essential distinction. In a game, man is free to play or not as he chooses. No such option is open to this generation of Americans. If men play, they are free to limit their stakes. No such limitation is ours today. The old parties of the Weimar Republic never agreed to stake all their liberties and the lives of European Jews on a game of chance with Hitler. But this, in fact, was the stake they lost. More disturbing still, it is not even necessary to know what is at stake. The rules of the game are simple. Play, we must. And if we lose, only then, in the goodness of time, will we know what stake we have lost. Our game is in deadly earnest, for the stakes in our game of nationhood are indeed our life and the way we live it. If this world were tranquil, our composure could be comforting. But tranquility has been now banished from the councils of our calculations. Though this land is but 180 years young, we live still amid a revolutionary age, and we do not live alone. Around this globe, across these continents, there are others who at long last have turned their battered countenance to the windward side of history. And this, in large measure, is our own doing. In Henry Steele Commager's happy words, we are the oldest of the new nations. Ours was the first of the great world revolutions. And it was no stroke of chance that a rioter arrested in front of a US information agency library in Africa responded to questions with the phrase, the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. And he was quoting a US book in wide circulation in Africa by an author named Thomas Jefferson. Our revolutionary age has multiplied, but there are not one but many revolutions. The political revolution of new nations, the economic revolution of new wants, the biological revolution of exploding populations, and the scientific revolution of new knowledge. The path of the future lies shrouded in the dynamics of change. Though no man of rational wit would dare predict, it seems reasonable to conclude that that change in that future may be even more significant. And I suggest in all seriousness that anyone who believes that the future will be easier than the past is mad. The chronicle of modern times has been the dominance of the North European nations. Even in this country, we like to think that recent history has been molded in our image. 
if that be the burden of your reflection, then savor well the poverty of your recollection. America's day of one land among the many is ebbing. New centers of power arise from old ashes in Asia. By centuries end, China and India will be industrialized, and China's population will be close to one billion souls. Europe, in its infant clothes of newborn unity, will in short time grow to the restiveness of rebellious. And who among us could doubt that regional unity will in its day come to Latin America and to Africa? The Atlantic civilization has not lost its focus, but the light of civilization will no longer be focused exclusively on the Atlantic. For history is changing from the Atlantic to the Pacific and to the Indian Ocean as well. This is not the beginning of the American century, nor is it the beginning of anyone else's century, certainly not the communists. And if there are other actors advancing onto the stage of life, it behooves us to acknowledge the reality that America will not be alone at center stage and that modesty is never in ill grace. It would also be unreal of us not to acknowledge that great advantage in these circumstances lies with the communists. For revolution is predicated upon change. When the ordered society is in a state of change, the marketplace of ferment gives premium to the wares of communism's deceit and hypocrisy. But let us not misread these events. Communism did not invent the world's revolution. Every one of them, political, economical, biological, and scientific, had their origins in our way of life. Wittingly or not, the West launched them all. It is communism that takes advantage of the momentum we generated. They exploit the momentum with anti-imperialist jargon and proclaim their false brotherhood of communist man. The debasement of their people, the fallacy of their promises, the abandonment of their principles, the humiliation of their leaders, all this bears witness to the falsity of their creed. But it is to our everlasting shame that in the years since World War II, we have given them by default the initiative that was our birthright. There is irony in the belief that the struggle in this bipolar world polarizes around the twin poles of capitalism and communism. The capitalism of Karl Marx is as dated here as the feudalism of the czars is dated there. Marxist ideology suggests that there exists outside the communist orbit, a static and basic condition. They call it capitalism. And they assume that since the lifetime of Marx in the last century, it has undergone no change. Anyone who has seen the world around us would acknowledge how false this is. Our society today is the society of the middle way. It is the mixed society. We have proven to our peers that it is possible for the state to evolve social security and economic growth without banishing political and civil freedom. Far from being unstable and doomed, as Marx predicted, our society has shown that that society functions best, which functions on the basis of personal liberty and of social concern. And it happens elsewhere as well. There is today not one social and economic system outside the communist orbit. There are near as many systems as there are countries. And some of them, in their democratic economics, are even closer to the ideals which Marx conceived as the good society than they are to the laissez-faire capitalism that was typical of Marx's day. Capitalism, in its traditional sense, exists in only one place today. It exists in communist orthodoxy.
in the minds and the mouthings of the communist ideologue, who spares his own belief the test of relevance to reality. Aware of it or not, the world has passed these poor souls by and left them whirling in violent back currents quite detached from the mainstream of real life. But economic jargon all but obscures the main issue. The disagreement between Moscow and the West is not really a disagreement over which form of social system is most productive. It is rather a disagreement about what is most important in the first place in the lives of people. It is not capitalism versus communism. It is, at base, the right of man to make his own choice, free of the strictures of the state, and not the right of the state to predetermine those choices for him. It is simply freedom versus coercion. It has always been the privilege of this land to regard its future as sustained by the belief of optimism. We have always regarded our future as indestructible, compatible, malleable, even benign in the portent of its hope. But the agent forces of history no longer circumscribe us in so complacent a comfort. If one thing is certain, it is that the consolation of our past will be sorely called to task that forces are abroad today, totally unlike anything that has gone before, and that if our yesterdays were sheltered, our tomorrows will stand naked to an array of challenge, the variety of which no man can predict. I do not belittle that optimism, but I do suggest that our optimism has on occasion misled us. It has, I suggest, given us a false degree of confidence as to how free we have been to mold history. When our success in history has coincided with the movement of history, it has led us to believe that history is the product of our own effort. It has not made realists of us when history runs not with but counter to our designs. It has made it not a sign of wisdom, but a suspicion of weakness to think of what is impossible. And optimism has done one thing further. It has given us an oversimplified idea of what is history. The forces that we have harnessed, placed in another environment, might give a totally different outcome. Our optimism conceives of technical progress as only enlarging productive powers. What then of technology having social repercussions quite different from productivity alone? Our optimism conceives of political hope as leading naturally to popular democracy as it did in the cradle of our own country. What then of politics in lands where the conditions of Western democracy have never existed. Our optimism conceives of economic advance as an end and goal in itself, as it was in our grandfather's century of insufficiency. What then of the new problems of organization and values that come with the growth of abundance? Optimism is not to be abandoned but it is perhaps wisdom that it be tempered. This century has seen extraordinary attempts to reshape the running forces of history. Some men by force of will and wills of force have even imposed their will on history, but the toll for humanity has been near catastrophic. Invariably too, those changes successfully inaugurated have usually been in accord with the drift and direction of world history. I know of no successful revolution against the forces of technology and against popular political aspiration. The fact that history runs too deeply to be turned aside does not mean that our future is predetermined, but it does mean our future will be molded with scant comfort to those who shun challenge. To what ultimate end historic forces will carry us, none can know. But who among us can gain say what will be the final impact of science and technology 
the end effect of egalitarian political ideals, the concluding results of collectivism, and the outcome of social conscience. We only know that these influences are firmly mounted in the saddle of history. Short of the profoundest change in the character of civilization or an incalculable redirection of events, these will dominate the environment that will be our future. Do not, I suggest to you young ladies and gentlemen, be too discouraged at the mess of unpalatable porridge uh, that, the older, that the older generation may have left to you. I suggest that we have at least demonstrated that courage lives on. We will have restored the belief that faith and loyalty can lift common men to greatness. And upon this, you, the youth, will build. And you will build it well, for in fact, you have no other choice. We are all in the phrase of Rabelais, going now to seek our great perhaps. And I would make only one final suggestion, and that is it is never unsuitable to greet the unknown with a cheer.